This talk, this session, this panel will be mediated by uh, Dr. David uh, Shaywitz, and each uh, panel member will give a talk and return to their seats, and then everybody will assemble for the uh, Q&A session. I want to briefly um, introduce Dr. David Shaywitz. David is truly one of the most insightful um, and incisive while being extremely mild-mannered people I know. And um, out of, uh, to make a special treat for you, he is wearing a bow tie today, which ever since he went to the West Coast, he has abandoned. Um, he is MD, PhD, trained here at the Harvard, uh, at the, Har uh, the Health Sciences Technology Program, which is a joint uh, Harvard-MIT program where he did his MD and his PhD. He studied a lot of uh, biology of various stripes and then has gone on to work in industry. No, currently, he's the chief medical officer of DNA uh, Nexus. He also, and I strongly recommend this, uh, hosts with uh, Lisa Sunan a really interesting uh, podca podcast uh, called Tectonics. And uh, I've certainly been listening to it even before he chose to interview me. So without further ado, David, I hand you the panel. Have fun. It looks like a great one. Thank you. The one thing Zach um, forgot is I'm also privileged to serve as an adjunct scholar at uh, DBMI. Um, so I'm obviously so excited to be back here in Boston among so many former classmates and friends and uh, colleagues and participating in what has for several years struck me as a particularly distinctive precision medicine conference, representing in a fashion so clearly reflective of Zach himself, the leading edge of scientific sophistication, informed by and always in service of a profoundly humanistic core and an enduring commitment to patients. In this respect, and so many others, Zach and I have been deeply influenced by the late Judah Folkman, I especially remember a talk Dr. Folkman gave for the Soma Weiss Research Day at HMS, where he talked about the central distinctive role of the inquisitive physician, and more broadly, how medical progress is driven more than anything else by impassioned individuals determined to make a difference. Similarly, writing in Nature, Flowers and Melman came to a remarkably similar conclusion uh, in their study of pharma success stories, finding that the key factor in most every instance they examined was a champion, an individual whose belief in the mission enabled the team to overcome a staggering number of obstacles and ultimately reach the clinic and improve the lives of patients. This year, once again, Zach has convened an astonishing, inspiring group of champions, as I'm sure you've already sensed from that magnificent keynote from Shirley. It's my genuine pleasure to host this first panel featuring four impassioned leaders. You'll hear from Jamie Haywood, whose experience caring for his brother with ALS motivated him to launch Patients Like Me. From Noga Levener, whose young company, Picnic Health, is audaciously tackling the formidable challenge of personal health data stewardship. From Matt Might, who I think most of us know, whose singular determination to understand and seek out a treatment for a rare genetic condition affecting his son Bertrand has empowered patients, parents, and care providers around the world. And we'll hear first from Pamela Gavin, whose group, the National Organization for Rare Diseases, recognized the power of integrating the long tail and provides a strong, unifying force for good. So let us give a nice welcome to our first speaker, Pamela Gavin. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm here to talk a little bit for a few minutes about um, how I got to where I am today and a little bit about NORD. Um, NORD is uh, short for the National Organization for Rare Disorders. It's a 501c3 nonprofit organization established over 33 years ago by patients, caregivers, and advocates who, um, at the time, were struggling uh, to seek and obtain access to treatments for their loved ones with rare diseases. Back um, in the late 70s and early 80s, way before social media and the internet as we know it today, um, 
families were either told that there's nothing they can do for them or if there were treatments that they had to go overseas because there was no real great incentive for folks to study and develop treatments for rare disorders. There was no economic incentive. So they spent several years advocating across the country and with a little assistance from those of you who may remember Jack Klugman um, and um, his uh, movie, uh, his TV show, his brother had a rare disease and was a writer for the show and um, wrote stories for the show and got the attention of Congress. Ultimately, after some fits and starts, um, President Reagan signed um, into bill into law the Orphan Drug Act in 1983. Um, Jack Klugman actually became Nord's first chairman of the board, and the families and advocates got together at that point and said, "We need to incorporate. We need to see this come to light. We need to be able to, if anything, we've learned that we need to get together and support one another." Um, through this journey and continue to promote and protect the Orphan Drug Act and build into our healthcare system a network of support for patients and families. So in addition to the evolution of the Orphan Drug Act, once NORD incorporated a few months later, um, NORD has advocated for the offices of rare diseases both at NIH and FDA. Um, advocated for funding for the undiagnosed network and many other um, uh, resources and programs as it relates to supporting um, rare diseases and, and those afflicted uh, by them in this country. For me, I have um, the great honor of joining this organization. I never set out to do this for a living. Um, I joined NORD in 2010. Um, my uh, nephew, the first grandchild in my family, was born with a rare disease called metachromatic leukodystrophy. It's a lysosomal storage disorder. And um, at the time, like many, many of those of, uh, impacted by rare diseases, was misdiagnosed and um, treated for symptoms until ultimately received the diagnosis here across the street at Children's. Um, and unfortunately, my family was told to keep him comfortable, go home and love him for as long as you have him. And, um, and that was all that could be done. One of the opportunities, the brightest lights at that time was the genetic counselor team, if you will, gave my family the, a card and literature from an organization called NORD. And it was really the first foray into communicating with anybody who knew anything um, about rare disorders. Uh, and lo and behold, we found a family of people and a community. Not what it is today. Fortunately, it's larger because it didn't mean that it didn't exist. It just meant that it hadn't coalesced into what it is today. So for me, uh, many years later, to have an opportunity to work in an organization that had such a profound impact on my family despite not having a treatment for my nephew, um, I saw, because my family's very close, um, firsthand how that impacts the community, your, 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 the family, the medical community, the social community. My nephew, because of the great care that he received, palliative care, lived far beyond his expected years. So what does that mean? How do you create the, the financial and the social and the uh, psychological network of support that's necessary when, when um, people live longer than expected? So. Um, I'm really fortunate to be at NORD to um, help uh, with, I think the phrase that I like to, to I think about the most is, I'm sure I'm going to get it wrong, but the concept of rising tides elevates all boats. I know I can't develop a cure for metachromatic leukodystrophy, but I can support those who are working on that cure or that treatment. And the same with all the education, research, and advocacy work that needs to happen in order to improve the lives of those impacted in this country um, by rare diseases. So it's a gift for me to be able to take that experience and that of 
others and help um, expand their voice and fight for um, the improvements, um, both medically, scientifically, um, as well as uh, socially. Uh, and if it helps, and, if, and, and to the extent that it, it's beneficial to collaborate with others that are not necessarily in the rare disease space. Um, people often don't know that we learn a lot about common diseases from studying rare diseases. So um, that um, is a little bit of my journey and how I got to um, have the privilege of being at the National Organization for Rare Disorders and working with some um, amazing, talented people, not only within the organization, but within the network of our membership, as well as the stakeholders in the community, um, like those on our panel that um, I have the pleasure to support. Thank you. Fantastic. Our, our next speaker is Jamie Haywood of Patients Like Me. Um, it's a pleasure to be back here. Um, and Zach, I, I always enjoy this meeting and the dialogue. Um, I think uh, I, I want to lead off of something that Shirley was asked as the last question, which is how do you scale this? Um, because there's a number of us that have been through our own personal journeys. Um, you know, I started with my brother's ALS, um, you know, founded a research institute, did the first stem cell transplant in the field, um, did some of the work that led to replication, and, and that was done as an engineer, not as a physician and not a PhD, but just someone that, that had someone they cared about that was willing to commit real resources to making a dent in that. Um, and I was funny, I was remembering as you were going through some of the analysis, my mom had a, an in situ ductal carcinoma diagnosis, and um, I, I pulled up every article and built a spreadsheet, and I called my mom a couple days later, and I said, you know, Mom, I have good news. And she's like, what? She said, well, no one with your tumor profile has ever died in a five-year study, as far as I can identify, so your risk of death has gone down on diagnosis. <laughs> and it was funny, but it wasn't, because it was interesting that the, the math, in her case, wasn't, wasn't available. Like, you have to really build it. And, but what's disappointed to me is that you know, you, the question about numeracy, you know, it, the data's there. We just don't do the math. You know, we don't collect the data in a format that's usable or comparable, and it's sort of... So I think when we talk about being at a crossroads for a second, I, I, um, the crossroads is really profound. I lived with one, through one before. The, the, the crossroads is the difference between programming on a mainframe when a few academics and a few people at top companies had the power to access computing to solve some novel problems or NASA to the invention of the personal computer. And I learned to program. I'm old enough to have learned to program in a mainframe. I, I programmed at a PDP 1170. I hard coded uh, machine language in that context. Um, but when the personal computer showed up, I remember one saying, wow, these are cute. They're, they're cute. They don't really do anything, though. You know? And, and, and all, you know, the professionals really use mainframes, right? We don't really play with these toys. And there was this whole generational gap between the, the past and the future, and very few people bridged across it. And those are the ones that we hear the legends about. So we stand at that crossroads right this moment in time. And what I talk about in personalized medicine is just to say, it's not here yet because it sucks. It does. It's just not that useful. It's useful in very selected, deep, rich context. You know? But it's about to not suck. It's about to not suck in really profound ways. And I just want to talk about that for a second. So you know, this is the thesis on which patients like me was built. It was built on this from my brother who had ALS. It was built on this for, you know, people I love that have mental health issues. Um, uh, and cancer is actually not something we really cover. But it's, of course, it's not about cancer. It's really about all of these different things. It's about life itself. And, and if it was on a Mac, because PCs never render anything correctly, that would say life. Because <coughs> technology does matter. But, but um, you know, in that context, about life, what that looked like, because I, what I know is that the data we have now is not structured to address this issue. You know, if you structure the data correctly, the math is easy. It's like because the data is not structured, we spend all this time talking about math and statistics and things like that. So, so if you look at this sort of concept of life, you know, either you're, zero, you're alive or you're dead with some risk factor, and you live roughly programmed death about 120 years, you know, can go up or down a little bit to basically things. And things go wrong in that journey. And, you know, you're going along in life and you get to some point, you know, maybe you're having a, an early cancer or some crisis or something like that, and you are faced with a choice at that moment in time. 
and you make a decision. We make lots of decisions. We make a decision every day. You know, uh, two nights ago, I, I made a decision to have too much wine with a group of friends. That's a decision that has consequences on my health. So that decision maps out, and you have A or B. You know, maybe it's treatment A or treatment B. And, and one of those treatments allows you to return to health and have a normal life. One of those decisions. And, when, you know, when I went back to my mom's in situ thoughtful carcinoma, when I told the physician my analysis of her outcome, he said, well, you know, we still have to treat her. And I said, yeah, I understand. And you know, she went through radiation and, and, um, and, and, uh, and treatment. But what he did admit, that he would never collect the data that proved that what he was doing was not helpful. You know, and so I think that this is about collecting the null hypothesis, the, 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 the value of inaction in that context. Now, how are we going to do this? You know, DNA has had this huge promise, but it actually really at an individual level has not been all that useful. There's a couple of really interesting papers that came out recently about the sort of complexity of personal interpretation. I'm talking about um, uh, uh, germline genetics, not, not tumor genetics, which are really state. Um, but there's a lot more technology hitting the market now. Things in, in proteins and antibodies and metabolites and the biome that really have very little to do with that flat graph of the gene of your right, life. But the actually these are actually really a GPS for where you are right now. And in fact, some of the technologies that iCarbonX and patients like me have been partnering and investing in are very specific technologies to measure this um, uh, in, in protein. And in this case, what we've looked at are things that are the GPS for your moment in time. Where are you right now? But we have GPS now on a planet that no one's explored. We don't know what anything means. We don't know whether I'm healthy or not. We don't know what my age is. We don't know what my... Um, my diseases that I have are, and in fact, we don't really know that with these precision technologies for anything. So we're at the beginning of this new journey, this personalized shift. But the nice thing about this is the power is really remarkable. It doesn't take 10,000 people to find a signal. You can find it in 100. You can find a drug signature in 100. So these new technologies are going to give us actual personalized medicine. But you have to match them to other data, phenotype, life, clinical, treatment data, diet, behavior. You have to integrate all of this in a format that is computable and usable where the math falls out to design our information architecture to serve the need to make the decision, not to serve individual research, not to serve care profit, which is the primary purpose of an EMR, but to serve the ability for an individual to make a better decision. Now, the other part about this is really important is we have to move off this model of life is full of problems, you know, diagnoses, interventions. That's really sick care. You know, and, and the vast majority of what we do fits in this model. We have to move to something much more Eastern in philosophy, which is, you know, each of us has within us, even when we're facing something like cancer or ALS, this imbalance or resilience that, that drives the rate of our disease. You know, the, the, the comment about optimism and, and, and self-proliferation is both pejorative and awful, but there's also a component of truth to it, which is that your body's ability to heal itself is a dangerously holistic thing that we ignore. And so all, understanding all of the challenges to that, how our environment or our stresses or our diet or the things we do, which we have no information on, so there's no right to judge anyone on it, but these are things that do affect the outcome. And measuring that resilience and that imbalance and the ability to absorb treatment or make a difference are things that will make that. And if we figure that out, it isn't about one intervention or one answer. It's about holistic solutions that tune people back to a health state. So this is really what we need to build and what we are building. So what patients like me is doing now is taking our 500,000 learning network where we take data about patient experience and iterate it back and help them make decisions based on that. And we're adding biology. And, and, you know, as of now, we are enrolling patients. Um, uh, I draw my blood every two weeks at the moment, or actually 10 days. And we, we do the full battery of everything on it. And I am building a digital model of me. And we're going to build digital models of tens of thousands of people. And the goal is to have, you know, capacity in thousands per month by the end of the year, tens of thousands a month by the end of next year, hundreds of thousands a month per the year after. Because we want people to have the data and to distribute it and to be able to take it to where they want to get it analyzed and also to provide answers now that do not require numeracy. But we believe that the people that will be served like this, just like the personal computer revolution, are those that adopt the technology first, not the ones that run the mainframes. And, and we would like to go on that journey with as many people that want to go into that personalized future as possible. Thank you. All right. I, uh, who knew going from uh, Bay Area to um, Cambridge uh, would be to hear 
genetics trashed and transcendentalism extolled, but uh, <laughs> still, uh, it'll be a good discussion. Um, our next uh, speaker is uh, Noga Levener of um, Picnic Health. So uh, I don't have any slides here. So um, I um, and I'm also going to do a little bit of kind of going back to the West Coast here as I um, talk a, a little bit about my journey starting Picnic Health. So what we do is is pretty straightforward. Um, basically, we look at you know one single patient, any one of you in the audience here, and we say you know for you as an individual we can and how can we go get literally all of your medical record data and get it in a format that's useful and do it today. Um, not, you know, in an imaginary future where we have interoperability, but like at this very moment. Um, so I, I'm going to share just a tiny bit about kind of the journey um, and hopefully um, you guys won't think I'm I'm too naive, although I look back on when we started the company and, um, and uh, it's, hard, it's hard not to see how, how naive I was and, and my co-founder, uh, my technical co-founder was. Um, so my experience was basically, I, I was a patient, I am a patient, like everyone here. Um, I have Crohn's disease and was just like super, super frustrated. Um, I had the experience of, you know, um, essentially having to kind of be a project manager for being a sick person, right? So the bad part isn't just that you're sick and you can't, you don't have energy, you can't walk around, but then you kind of got to deal with all these logistics around getting records and sending them to people. And, um, and along the way, a few people in medical records offices were like kind of mean to me. Um, and because I have a giant chip on my shoulder, I started this company to get back at them and basically say that we were going to um, solve the problem. And at the time, this was a few years ago, um, you know, I just asked around. I talked, we're in Silicon Valley, talked to a few friends, and people were telling me, like, there's this really cool thing coming out. Like, there's this meaningful use thing, and there's this blue button thing. And, like, within, you know, six to 12 months, like, there's just going to be APIs. This is all going to be available, and you'll just be able to build, like, a layer on top of that. Um, and it's going to go great. And so I was like like sold this is awesome like these you know these crazy luddites in healthcare have no idea um have no idea what they're doing like why hasn't anyone done this um and in the process you know i have a kind of brilliant data scientist um who uh, i'd been working with an engineer um and uh, we got ourselves into the most prestigious incubator in silicon valley with this idea we had built kind of like a little prototype um, and about halfway through, you know, they were kind of like, guys, like, why isn't anyone using this? Um, wh why can't you get any users? Um, and, you know, and we, we just kind of said, like, well, it's because it's there isn't actually any data coming from this thing. Um, so, so it's not useful to people, so they won't use it. Um, and after a visit to the doctor's office for a Xanax prescription, um, this is a very, very high pressure situation. Um, we kind of took a step back and said like, all right, we got we to gotta deal with reality here. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, probably drive a few people crazy here and give like the classic Silicon Valley, this is like the Paul Graham line, which is um, from Y Combinator, which is do things that don't scale. Um, and so we sort of said like, all right, if we're going to actually be able to do this, if we're going to be able to take any one person in America and say, we can get all of your medical records. We can make this problem go away for you. The way to do that is going to be to do insanely unscalable things. Um, and that's essentially what we did. So when we launched a couple years ago, um, we had a beautiful interface that our engineering team built. Um, we had a great you know, press launch. All these people signed up, and they paid us money. And on the back end, we basically had like a couple, we had like a doctor and a couple of people um, on our team with a fax machine. And, you know, this doctor basically going through this record, these records and just typing things into Excel. You know, like, okay, CBC, LOINC code, 
Um, and that, that was how Picnic Health got off the ground. Um, and since then, you know, we have basically just iteratively chipped away one thing at a time at automating this process. We get electronic data where we can get electronic data. We get, um, you know, where we can't do that, we just do it the old fashioned way, which basically means we get faxes. If we send a fax and we don't hear back, a little task pops up for someone to call that hospital and they say, oh, well, the GI department, they have their own office and you have to put attention Mary and it's not in 14 point font. We learn that um, and then we never have to learn it again the record comes back and we actually now um, through this process have generated enough training data that we're actually able to use machine learning, use a machine learning algorithm to go through the record. It's not perfect at structuring the data, far from it, but it's, it's a good start and it means that the doctor um, and now that room full of nurses has to do a lot less work um, than you know when we launched a couple of years ago. So um, that's the gl uh, glamorous story of how um, we got into uh, into doing this work. And um, now, essentially, Picnic Health is a company that works directly with patients to help um, gather all their medical records and. Um, and structure all the data from those records so that we can display it back in a really nice way. Guys, it's really cool. Come talk to me if you want a discount code so you can check it out. Um, it's, it's very, very complete. But what's maybe been most gratifying about, um, about this work is realizing just what an important role we can play in precision medicine. Um, so a lot of the work we do these days is basically working with folks like you guys, where we sort of say like, okay, you have a patient cohort, you have this 100 people, you have this 10,000 people, you have these, you know, 350,000 people, um, you know, how can we go today and take those people in that cohort and get their data? Not um, data from one hospital, not data from, you know, a single EMR, but literally how can we provide the EMR data, structured, machine readable, um, that, that can be used and linked to all of the other information um, that folks like you gather when you do a precision medicine study. Um, and so that's where we are today. We hope that we can um, keep working in this iterative, pro iterative process, driving the cost down, and, um, and I still have a dream that uh, someday um, we will be able to pull data out of those APIs that people were telling me about four years ago. Very, very, very cool stuff. Um, Matt. Matt, Mike. All your... All right, uh, well, thanks for having me back yet again, Zach. Um, before we get going, I have to make a brief disclaimer. So I started working at the White House uh, a little over a year and a half ago, and due to some circumstances outside the scope of this talk, uh, I'm still working there today. Um, so the communications officer, or, or communications office, which is still Sean Spicer for now, uh, requires me to tell you that this is a personal talk. And what that means is that this may not reflect the views of the president or the administration. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, so I'm here to tell you a story. It's uh, actually my son's story. It's a story of what happens when you're told, as we were, that your child is the first case ever discovered of an ultra-rare disorder, uh, and the, sort of the, the aftermath of that. And it's a story that I think really illustrates why it is that we need academia and government and industry uh, and patients to come together to make precision medicine real. And today I'm going to focus mostly on the industrial component, and not just because it's a theme for today. Uh, I really do believe that while academics and patients can make precision medicine possible, it really is the entrepreneurs that will make it feasible. So I'll tell you about a company that I've helped co-found called Paranomics, uh, but also tell you about some other companies too that I think are doing good thing for patients today. So the first, the first, the, the sort of the Cliff Notes versions of my story, uh, nine years ago, uh, my son Bertrand was born. He had seizures, developmental delays, a movement disorder, and a very curious lack of tears. Um, after a two-year diagnostic odyssey, we had eliminated virtually every disease uh, that this, this, this could be. In fact, we did eliminate every disease. There was no known disease left that we could have diagnosed him with when you sort of intersected all of his symptoms together. 
Um, ultimately, it was a research study at Duke University that agreed to do exome sequencing for him and found that he had, in fact, inherited two loss of function mutations in a gene called NGLY1. And then came some very unexpected news. They believed that this was the cause of the disease, but they also said that he was, in fact, the, the first and hence the only known patient in the world that appeared to be suffering from this. Uh, so I, what, what I tell people is that as, as parents, you know, we, we all want to believe that our children are unique and special. Um, but I can tell you that, that when you discover that they actually are, it could be really profoundly sort of unsettling. <laughs> So I'll skip over most of the story at this point, and, uh, and the, the sh but the short version is that you're right after he was diagnosed, I used social media to coalesce uh, and really discover a community of patients around the world that, that had this disease. They, they had no idea what they had un until we found them or they found us. Um, but uh, you know, today, five years later, we have 57 patients with this ultra-rare disease, a, a disease which I estimate probably has around 500 patients in the entire world. Um, and uh, right about the same time, I also began to galvanize research efforts into understanding, treating, and curing this disease. Now, if you were in the first edition of this conference, I'll tell you in five sentences what I'd spent 30 minutes on back then. Um, looking at the metabolic pathways involved in this disease, I reasoned that Bertrand and likely the, the other patients were, were, were short in a compound called anacetoglucosamine. They were prob probably in deficit in this. So I uh, Googled it, found it on Amazon, bought a bottle of it. Uh, I took it myself and didn't die. Um, and after that, I concluded it was probably safe for Bertrand to take as well. So after a severe hospitalization, I decided, you know, it's, it's time to find it, actually figure out if this stuff really works. Uh, I realized that if I'd left this stuff sitting on my shelf and never tried on him, I, I wouldn't have forgiven myself if we hadn't seen if it would have an effect. So um, uh, I put him on it, and about three days after he went on, uh, he actually started crying tears for the first time in his life, and in fact, for the first time in the history of this disorder. So two years after the discovery of this disease, um, you know, and after, after sort of many attempts to do something for it, we finally had landed a therapeutic blow, which meant that, yes, we can make a dent in this disease. Uh, it gave me hope that there was more that we could do. And in fact, I already knew that there was more that we could do. So if you've heard me speak before, you probably don't know any of what I'm about to tell you, and that's because I couldn't tell you. Uh, we've been doing a lot of science for the past four years, all pre-publication, all confidential, with, science sharing, with scientists sharing everything with each other uh, and the promise of sort of not scooping each other. But now it's finally all published, so I can share with you what we have been doing in secret for so long. Uh, four years ago, Tadashi Suzuki, a researcher in Japan, realized that if you take out a second gene in mice that have this disease, a gene called Engaze, uh, the mice actually dramatically recover. They do significantly better uh, uh, when you take out the second gene. And I learned right away that significantly better is a Japanese expression for no longer dead. Um, <laughs> so it's a pretty dramatic improvement. <laughs> Uh, so as soon as he shared this result with me, I realized that we had to find an inhibitor for Engase. Uh, this, this became sort of a driving therapeutic mission for the disease as a whole. Uh, it took me almost two years, but I did end up getting a grant to do drug development for Engline 1, and Engase was going to be the target. Uh, we confirmed this finding in planarian worms, so it worked in mice, it worked in worms, probably works in people too, right? Um, and then, with some colleagues at the University of Utah, we actually did docking simulations to find um, uh, small molecules that served as inhibitors for, for this target. So we basically looked for small molecules that were inverse in shape and charge to the catalytic domain on this, on this uh, pr protein Engase. And uh, the amazing thing is we actually found 70. We screened around 200,000 molecules originally, and we found 70 that looked like they worked. 14 were FDA approved, and one of those actually worked in the lab, and we tested it with mass spec. And that one drug happens to be Prevacid, uh, which you can buy at Costco. So. Bertrand's been on it now for a few months, and I have seen him making developmental strides that I have not really seen him do uh, since he was all, basically a year old. And it seems to be really impacting the developmental aspect of this disorder. You know, so to sort of summarize the journey to date, you know, when Bertrand was young, we were alone, and today we have a community. When Bertrand was young, his eyes were so dry that his eyelids could scratch the surface of his corneas. Today, he can cry, his corneas have healed, and he can see clearly. When Bertrand was young, he would have dozens of clinical seizures every day. Today, he has none. When Bertrand was young, he was in constant and relentless misery. Uh, I can tell you today as a parent that Bertrand is happy, and he's happy all the time. And in the end, I think, you know, well, that's really what any parent wants. They want their child to be happy. So I think in some sense, we've already succeeded uh, in doing what we're supposed to do. But, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to have something like this happen to you and not have your life change. So at this point, I, I've really devoted my life to making sure that Bertrand's story is not a one-off uh, and that we will be able to repeat this process over and over again. Uh, so I'm grateful that people like Zach have stepped in and allowed me to serve on the Harvard faculty in pursuit of this, uh, of this mission. Um, but I also I want to see it as real as possible, as quickly as possible, and so that's why I've turned to industry as a vehicle for delivery. Uh, so as a first test of that theory, I've had the opportunity to co-found a biotech with some truly remarkable colleagues, uh, including Matt Fox, 
Fox and David Goldstein. And the founding ethos of our company is what can we do for, to help patients today? What is available now? What is the low-hanging fruit in precision medicine? And the answer we came up with was genetic epilepsies. Uh, so we built a company called Paranomics that focuses on repurposing existing drugs as novel treatments for genetic epilepsies based on an, individual, uh, on an individualized basis. Um, for, for patients, particularly those that have an observable defect in electrophysiology that, that typically related to an ion channel or an ion receptor, we can, we can screen thousands of drugs for them today. And that's what we've been doing over the past year and a half or so. And I'm happy to report that some of our top ranked recommendations um, have already dramatically changed the lives of patients with these devastating conditions. In fact, just this morning, Matt Fox was showing me a text message and video from, from the parent of a patient that had recently started treatment. The mother reported that she's, the, this, 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 this girl is sleeping through the night for the first time ever, and more remarkably, this is a patient that was wheelchair, wheelchair bound when we met her, um, and she's essentially, essentially kind of locked in her own body. Uh, in this video, she's swimming. Um, so this, this makes me believe that this, this model is real and we can do this today. Uh, but the genome is large, and so there's actually a, a need for many, many players in this space. And there are other companies that are covering other regions of the genome. Uh, I've sent patients to companies like Perlara. So you're going to hear about Perlara later today from Ethan Perlstein. Uh, they use a model organism-based approach for looking for drugs for diseases. I've also sent patients to Recursion Pharmaceuticals, and they use a, a, a computer vision guided approach which piggybacks off of high resolution um, microscopy to build morphometric phenotypes for cells and use that as the basis for screening for drugs for patients. Uh, I've also sent patients to a company called Atomwise, which uses deep learning to do the kind of simulations that I used to find Prevacid for Bertrand, but now that you can do them almost at scale for, for other diseases. Uh, and in a week, I'll be launching another startup of sorts. I'll become the founding director of the Hugh Call Precision Medicine Institute at UAB. This is going to be a hybrid uh, research and clinical institute that will serve as a hub in precision medicine for both scientists and patients. Uh, because I sort of firmly believe that if, if we want to deliver on our clinical mandate to help patients today, uh, I'm going to have to encourage more academics to spin companies out to bridge the gap between the bench and the bedside. Because uh, I think if we take the long view on precision medicine, what this whole enterprise is really about, um, the attack surface that we're dealing with is the, is the human genome. And that's 20,000 genes large. So there's plenty of room for companies and scientists uh, to, to take on this challenge. So thank you. Have a seat. If I could have all the speakers uh, have a seat. Um, you know, every, I love this conference, and every time I'm here, you know, um, I remember I spent a couple of years as a management consultant, and there was some farmer project we did where we had a list to figure out, for help some company figure out, like, what, what diseases to target. So you did one of these things where you ranked all human ailments on, like, eight different criteria with different weightings, and you come up with some column at the end that kind of matched what the highest paying person in the room kind of wanted to hear. <laughs> and you, you sort of come up with a, with a plan for the company. And it seemed not necessarily the best way to, that, that the way the science that I learned really happened and the way discovery as, as Folkman and other described it happens. And here it's, you really see just the opposite. You see the power of, 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 of passion and commitment to, to powerfully change the world and, it's, it, it's, uh, and, and continue to change the world and it's so remarkable. Um, I'm sure there will be a ton of questions from the audience but borrowing Zach's uh, uh, prerogative. Um, let me start off by saying, what do you see as the major blocker between what you, where you'd like to get and where you are now? Not a million things and, oh, if only the world would change and be totally different than it is, that would be great. But if there's one thing that's blocking you from getting where you need to go, what would you point to uh, as something that might be changeable? And I'll start off with Matt because you probably thought about this the most. Um, all right. Well, you know, speaking again in a personal capacity, uh, I, I see one blocker at the moment as, as actually government, and um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, but, but, I mean, that shouldn't be a punchline, right? So, like, what specifically? Yeah. So, I, I, I think you know we, we need new models uh, at, at places like FDA uh, for how how do we do approval of these therapies for ultra small patient populations? How do we evaluate efficacy? You know, how, how do we sort of uh, you know, get get out of this mindset of it has to be RCTs all the time? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, and, and what, my, what I'm optimistic about is that I think there might actually be, you know, some receptiveness to this. I think we might actually have a chance to develop new models that deal with ultra-small patient populations and can speed approval in, in those instances. Okay, if I could just follow up on that, you're saying, you know, with, re with, regulator with you know, improved more um, uh, uh, regulations that uh, it favors small patient trials, um, probably obviously, let me ask Pam about that because it's been in the news a little bit. The challenge of how do you balance advocating effectively for patients 
while at the same time mean, you know, um, ensuring that whatever gets approved is in the best interest of patients and that the groups aren't co-opted by other organizations, as like the recent Wall Street Journal article was suggesting? Um, it's hard. It, it's not really, it's not easy. It's, um, I, I, I would say that um, with the advocacy work that's been done in rare diseases, I would say that the biggest um, changes have come along in the rare disease space as it relates to regulatory evolution um, and the number of um, applications that come before the FDA for approval and those that have approved under the Orphan Drug Act. Um, anybody can look it up online on their website, which is, can be hard to navigate, but it's out there and it's pretty remarkable. Um, but it's, it's not enough. And if you look at where we are today, I can't help but bring us back to some boots on the ground reality. We're struggling to understand what our healthcare system is going to look like from an access perspective, let alone looking at um, uh, you know, future um, regulatory pathways. The FDA has over 35% of its existing um, workforce open recs that have not been filled. So um, you, you could work on these new pathways, you can look at new legislation, but if you don't have the resources to implement it, it's really going to be a challenge. So you sound like you worry less about the agency being excessively permissive, because there was a lot of debate with, with some recent drug approvals in the rare, uh, recent drug approval in the rare disease space, with some saying that the approval came at sort of more of a political than a scientific conclusion. I just didn't know how you balance that. Um, I, think, I think some of that had, you know, I think we're dealing with the evolution um, and, and it actually affects the science and, and the great technologies that have been discussed. Um, as people become more empowered as individuals to participate, it also has empowered patient, patient organizations to, to be involved in the, in the dialogue, whether it be um, benefit risk analysis or their contributions to um, what they think about an approval of a product. Um, that kind of goes with the territory. Um, and I think we have to continue to work towards um, transparency and, and allowing all stakeholders that should have a voice in, or ta a seat at the table to be a part of that discussion. I, what we hear from our, the community that we work in more and more is that companies, um, biotech companies are more concerned with access and getting products paid for. Uh, it used to be when I, it wasn't very long ago when I started at, at Nord that everybody was focused on the FDA and getting through the regulatory pathway process and getting products approved. And now what we're seeing is that's really secondary on average um, to um, getting access and getting your products paid for. That's a huge issue both not only in the U.S. but abroad where there it's yes. this tragic situation of patients who have effective available drugs that um, can't, you know, d due to their otherwise much extolled healthcare system can't have access to these life-saving medications. Um, let me ask Matt, a uh, no, Matt sorry, uh, Jamie a question. One of the things you were talking about was the, um, uh, this ecosystem where there's a range of ways of, of monitoring patients. Um, it sort of it actually sounds, I know Jess is in the audience, that you have know, a baseline study a little bit, um, but where you're monitoring people, you know, sort of all this parameter. And what I'm wondering is, I can understand if someone has some terrible condition, you know, where, where it, it would, you people are really motivated to, to, to want to do anything one can, and we heard that in the first talk. But something I, um, sort of actually the Tectonics podcast host, Lisa Sunin, often talks about is people don't want to think about being sick. They don't, it's not clear them, to me that people want to be monitored 24-7 and want to sort of do all of that stuff. And one of the people who spoke to this actually was Chris Anderson. So Chris Anderson, former editor of Wired, right? He um, was sort of was all into quantified self, and then he sort of had a fa big famous article, right? Like a, within the last year, saying, "Sucks. I'm, I've tried it. I've advocated for it, and didn't really. There was no non-obvious insights that it came up with for me." So sort of raising the point, you know, saying, I mean, that's, I'm sure that's version 1.0, but the question is just, me, you know, the, the idea of people that say, "Well, to, to improve something, you have to measure it," but then. You know, does everyone want to just spend their time quantifying themselves, particularly if they're sick? No. All right? <laughs> so how does that mesh with what you're trying to do? Um, you know, th there's a, 
I mean, I think there's a, a couple things that are really different today. So, so the technologies to measure meaningful variance in state did not exist in any affordable or meaningful or quality control level five years ago. And, and now uh, are emerging quite quickly this year in a number of categories where they do. And, and so at some level, um, you, know, you couldn't know what your immune system looked like because it wasn't knowable. You couldn't know what your proteomic profile was because it wasn't knowable in a robust and reliable way with sufficient quality. You, and you know, these are the actual state of where you are. So you know, sailing wasn't so great when we used sextants and sails. Um, <laughs> it got better when we had steam engines and GPS, right? So, so, so we're in a new era. Um, the second thing is, you know, th th there's an infrastructure problem, a boot up issue. It's a little bit like Tesla's problem, which is, you know, how do you compete with automobiles when there's a gas station on every corner? We have to build a, s a network of electrical chargers, and you know, that's a huge infrastructure. Well, in, in the information space, knowing what health or disease or aging is and how you modulate them requires that you know what they are, and that means you have to use the technology over time in some population to understand that, and that's a boot up. You have to boot it up. Um, you, know, you could call it baseline, or ours is Ignite, and you just call it boot up, it doesn't matter. But the, but the part about the, 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 the people that are involved, look, you know what? Most people won't. But if 1% of the population says, you know, and I do myself because I'm crazy, and, and, and there's a few other people that'll be in the sort of deep experimental longitudinal, maybe 100 or 200, and then there'll be 10,000 that are doing five or six per year, and then there'll be millions. But what will happen is it will be, you know, I, I learned to program on an Apple II. It's, it wasn't easy. And you know what? Only 0.1% of the kids were stupid enough to try and do it. Well, 0.1% is an awful lot of people at scale. So you start with 1%, you go to 2 you make it easier, and then people start buying it. And then, so, I mean, this is the beginning of that journey. And what I think is important about distributed and virtualizing it, which is what we're doing, and, and breaking it out of the system cycle is, you know, if you're a physician and only 1% of your patients want to do this, you don't really have a study. If you're a nation and 1% of your people want to do this, you do. So I think that that's, you have to sort of think about breaking the institutional framework and hitting the people. And I care more about bringing the technology to the people with the problem than I do about sort of concentrating the people for people that think they are serving them anymore. It's, to me, it's about distributing it now. And I, uh, presumably, you're also in touch with Eric Dishman and the folks doing that. Of course. That, yeah. I, but, and, and by the way, this is, there's a lot of efforts. One of the things I want to be really clear about, too, is, and this was touched upon when you know, Matt mentioned the different parts of the genome. It's not just different parts of the genome. Medicine itself is an incredibly, when you talk about medicine, it's like talking about transportation and combining bicycles and airplanes in the same conversation. They're really different things. And so, um, you know, in our case, what we're working on and what we think is really important is a class Look, if, if we go and make a recommendation to change someone's cancer treatment um, and we're wrong, there's real consequences that are severe and awful for the patient and the system. Same thing in cardiovascular disease if you change the treatment standard. But, you know, the standard of care in mental health is what drug would you like first? Standard of care in, you know, in MS is to so, so some degree the physician's asking the same question. So if the standard of care is a coin flip with a, you know, with a, with a switching journey in the patient, Adding information into that to create something different means that you're starting up a learning network immediately. And, and the last part is, there's a whole class of disease. I love that you mentioned repurposing existing drugs. Look, I, I have a drug company. I make drugs. It'd be really nice <laughs> to make $80,000 a year to do that, but that's not going to work anymore. What we really have to get to is that the information value on the chemicals we have in our libraries today are where the values generate. So you have to switch to that. And so I like, to do, I like to think about holistic, almost Eastern medicine. How can we bring from the things that we know modulate biology, science to that at scale, so that we can use it today on people we love today. Uh, you know, and, that, and that's, that's really where we need to go now. I think it's also very interesting that you point out, and as, as, the, as, as Shirley pointed out in her first talk, these sort of almost natural situations of, you know, what the people in ethics right, call equipoise, where, you, you know, there isn't an, a particular treatment. There aren't data that speak persuasively to one treatment or another in some cases. And in that case, why not try something that's more you know, being be far more receptive to, to innovation. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Noga a question. So what um, you're doing with your um, company is, is really, really interesting. It's actually what David Blumenthal highlighted the need for last year in the Wall Street Journal when he was talking about, I mean, you hate to add more and more layers to the healthcare system, but he was 
um, essentially proposing a, lay a layer of health data stewards, which is effectively what, what it sounds like what you have done, where people, essentially because everyone's records are scattered to the winds, you almost need the, the, and the energy input to kind of consolidate it all so it's actually usable, which is something where you're doing. The first question is, when you're doing it, are you, is it, are you able to do it in this sort of any type of sort of elegant, electronic, all sort of Silicon Valley buzzword way, or is it more like the way we hear uh, Flatiron wound up doing doing it, where the aspiration was to have all this, you know, mechanical, um, you, know, uh, you know, learning, but in reality they wound up doing m uh, mechanical Turk, right? Where you sort of get a bunch of people in a room and just actually just try to get efficiencies that way. Yeah. What's your experience? Yeah, so I think um, I think we need to challenge the notion that like this that they're that those two things aren't consistent. Basically, if you actually look around at the way things work in Silicon Valley, like if you look at the way like Google develops its algorithms, if you look at the way Facebook develops its algorithms, if you look at how Uber works, in the background you always have people labeling data. You always have people labeling data. So. Um, so all of the tools that we're used to seeing where we see a seamless interface and we just, you know, th think there's like magic happening, um, you know, you can't get AI and machine learning working without having training data. So, um, so, so I think that, you know, whether you want to talk about, um, so we do a lot of what Flatiron does as well, where we have like human curators, um, but basically when you look at when you look at trying to go from a state of like um, human curators doing everything to a state of complete um, automation, complete automation, it's just a little. It, it basically, I think, like trying to thinking of that as a dichotomy where you're just going to go from like one end and flip it to the other end is just totally unrealistic. And um, and I think like the model from Silicon Valley companies is basically, you know, the for whatever reason, and I think like people don't even necessarily understand it that well, um, and I certainly don't understand it that well, feeding, um, feeding like corrected data back into an algorithm, the places where the algorithm couldn't get things right is, is actually by far the best way to improve that algorithm. So what we do is, you know, essentially the answer is all of the above. We use automation where we can um, and then, you know, we basically recognize that you have to add a human layer on top of that, um, particularly in medicine where you can't sort of say like, oh, great, 98% accuracy, that's cool. Just, we're just going to get a few things wrong in your record. Um, you really have to say like, wherever the algorithm is not like absolutely confident, we're going to go and have, you know, some human judgment look at that. Um, and then, you know, slowly, incrementally over time, we get closer and closer to a place where you, where you do have that, you know, slick, fancy automation. And uh, I mean, you know, presumably the way you're going to scale, I imagine, is by having more things uh, done uh, with automation. Now, it sounds like, as a second quest, related, I guess, follow up, is at the moment, it's what you're describing, it sounds like you're a, a service company. Is that, I know it's a dirty word in Silicon Valley, like in startups, not actually in private equity. Um, but you're you're um, you're a, a service company at the moment. Is that right? Well but I, yeah. but you are evolving to be a or do you aspire? Is there tip most many many companies sort of have this back? Are you going to be monetizing the data that you're collecting in some way as an aspect of your business model? Um, so I guess two two you know maybe two separate answers. So I think to answer your first question. I, I think like I don't really think of us as a services, you know, I think of us as a software company. Um, and I think that like, um, you know, I don't want to take credit for this idea because I'm sort of learning from, um, I'm sort of learning from my peers um, who, I, who I've seen do this. But I think basically the unit economics and the economics for companies that use AI and machine learning is just, um, it just, it requires a little bit of a different paradigm than thinking about like services versus software. Because, you know, that's sort of like saying, well, you know, Facebook is a services company because they have a room full of people curating uh, photos to make sure that they're not offensive, um, you know, offshore. And, um, you know, basically I think like a lot of soft, essentially like creating software and particularly when you're looking at machine learning or, or AI, um, having having human curators um, is really 
it is really part of the process of like building your software and part of building your IP and building the algorithm. Um, so, you know, I don't think of that as sort of like a, a cost of delivering the service. I think of it as a cost of, of building our software. So, mm -hmm. um, let me let people come up for questions if you have them now. Um, and while, let me ask you one other, um, maybe the panel, everyone doesn't have to answer, but I'd be curious on to views. When, um, Eric Topol's book, uh, Patient, um, We'll See You Now came out, um, I actually remember I, re I reviewed it, um, uh, reasonably generously, I thought, for the Wall Street Journal, but there was a review that came out in the New York Times with by Abigail Zugger um, that um, just profoundly took issue with it. But basically started off by saying, I don't know what world this guy practices medicine in, but it's nothing like I've ever seen. Um, I always come away from this conference with this incredibly inspired view of sort of patient-led medicine, and then a day or two out in like the world, it just, it kind of like, the reality kind of hits really hard. Where do you, how far down in the journey towards sort of patient-led medicine do you feel like we are? Yeah, so I, I think, uh, actually, I think Jamie touched on this, that you, you start off with the 0.1% and expand it to the 1%. And I think in terms of patient-led medicine, you, know, you, you have these icebreakers that are really, you know, you know charting the course. And I think we're, we're probably in the 0.1%, 1% range right now. Uh, but they really are developing the models that will make it scalable for all the patients to follow. So I'd say it's early, but, but I, th I think we have these examples now. Other thoughts? Well, William Gibson has a great quote about this, which is the, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. Um, Noga or Pamela, do you have a? I mean, I think we always need to have people on the leading edge and bleeding edge to push the envelope. But I think if we were um, really wanted to see any of those things come to fruition in the way that they could and should, we should always be looking at how do they get implemented? How do you take those um, wonderful ideas and concepts and products and ensure that the environment in which you're placing them in um, has the capacity to absorb them and leverage them? Because I can tell you, um, we're not there when it comes to healthcare. Um, I, my father's just had two brain surgeries over the last month and Sorry I've spent over eight hours in the hospital um, every day except for two days in the last month. And I can tell you when you can't get a healthcare proxy form that's legitimate into a medical record so that people can speak with you, we have a problem. Something as I'm basic that. as that. And introduce Hi. yourself uh, when you talk. Uh, my name is Ned Bacon. Um, I spent my life as a systems engineer in the aerospace business for a long time. Um, I have a question for Jamie. Uh, it seems to me that today a patient's big problem is the disconnect between um, well, the lack of transparency in trying to determine the quality of care and the cost of that care uh, that, that they have access to. And I'm wondering if the work that you're doing will address um, outcomes and cost at a very granular level eventually so that you bring the clinic and the, and the economics together somehow. That's a, um, that's a great question. I, I basically, it comes down to value, right? What's the value of each thing we do in the context of a, of a problem or a condition or an opportunity? Um, you know, I, I, so Patients Like Me is not a new company. We've been around for 12 years, and our, our primary business over the last five to seven years has been value measurement. So, so we do health economics, and we look at the, the value of a new therapy and compare where it addresses particular needs or, or how care paradigms are creating gaps. And um, it's not a great business model. <laughs> And, and that, unfortunately, people don't really care that much. You know, you, you end up working for some, uh, you know, very high-end drugs and some very high-end contexts, and you can do a lot of patient good, and you can sort of bring more information to the fore, and we do it in a very open and generalized way so that it's not like we're running spot studies, but we are generating common data. But the reality is, is there's very little economic interest in value in the healthcare system, despite the ACA or anything else. Um, and you know, going to your original question, David, you asked, you know, I, I, I was going to give two answers. Technically, everything we want to do is completely feasible right now. There's literally nothing in the stack to do everything that we want to do that is not technically completely feasible. Um, the challenge is that the economics of the healthcare system is largely disinterested in value or improvement. 
Uh, and there's a few exceptions to that in the context of new drugs, but the value of diagnostics, the value of reduced care costs, the value of making someone not go to a hospital is negative. So, so um, the, in that environment, um, the, the opportunity for us as a business is to move to places where we can create that sort of spot alignment. But um, yes, value will emerge as a primary outcome. And in fact, um, value as we see it involves not just the cost of the patient economically, but the cost of the patient emotionally and, and from a commitment and from a time and all of those other standpoints. So value will be holistically measured in that context. But, um, but it's not enough to run a business to create value. You have to run a business to actually create differential outcomes for patients directly. And if you don't do that, I think that we're not going to get the sort of recursive economics to make this thing take off. Okay. Go ahead. Hello, my name is David Platt. I teach computer science at Harvard University Extension School. I'm also the author of the book entitled Why Software Sucks. <laughs> it's true. On the web at whysoftwaresucks.com. Anyway, uh, my, qu my question is primarily for Jamie, though I'm uh, happy to hear what anyone, uh, any of the other panelists think. And that is, remember about 10 years ago, maybe it was 15, when the price of a CAT scan came down and, and, and it was like 995 bucks and it was the hot holiday present for, you know, upscale suburban nights. You know, get this for your nice husband so he doesn't fall over dead when he's 56, whatever. A lot of people bought those. Um, and then when people started looking at these scans, scans of many clinically healthy people, started seeing all kinds of you know, what appeared to be horrible bad stuff. Oh my God, this is connected over here. And oh, you know, geez, you got the thing over there. Um, all kinds of horrible false positive things that did not appear to be harming anybody. And my question is, now that you're looking at all of these you know, yourself and all these other people in such very, very great detail. Um, uh, how are you going to handle the signal to noise ratio of screening out these, these false positives that, that aren't really these, these indolent, these, these, these benign kinds of things that aren't really hurting anybody, but sort of kind of look at And while you're contemplating the answer, I would just point to Zach has a classic paper on the incidental ohm on this yeah, exact I was going to say, oh, I, I was going to you yes, took my line. I was going to, the, the, the incidental omas, which are the, the consequences of CAT scans, um, uh, uh, and it's extensive. When you look at the, the value of a CAT scan, what's really not included is the consequence of harm. So, so the, the percentage of time that a finding is incidental um, is, is profound. And in fact, if you look at imaging, there's really depressing data about, like, for instance, if the suggested indication is that someone has MS, the probability of finding a lesion goes up by somewhere between 4 and 10. So, you know, this is clearly unbiased scientific analysis. Um, I, you know, this is the... the the point I made about the null hypothesis is that you really have to start from the philosophy that essentially nothing's wrong. And, uh, you know, I'm very concerned about liquid biopsies and the, the, look, I have cancer in my body all over it right now. There are millions of cancer cells in my body and they're throwing off DNA left, right and center right now, but my body's dealing with it. And, you know, and, and so we can find anything. The question is, is finding something that's really meaningful and actionable. And, and you really have to start with, a, with, with an extreme bias for that. Um, it's going to be hard is the long and short answer. And I, I think that you, you have to really um, be thoughtful about where you start to engage in risk management and information. I mean, you know, PSA, go on and on. We don't want one of those. Yes. And, and I do think that what's important is that we will find really profoundly strong real signals. So, so you know, I hope in this case we can work down from the ones that actually mean something. I, I want to get to the next question, but also to add that, you know, I'm not sure if you don't, the answer to might find confusing stuff is therefore the answer is not to even bother looking, um, but rather to try to understand what the landscape is like and to develop a feel for the, um, for the terrain. Hello, uh, my question is regarding... Uh, introduce uh, yourself, please. Uh, I'm Mahesh from UMass Medical School, Booster. Uh, my question is regarding picnic health. Uh, so to you, Noga. Um, uh, moving from uh, moving the medical information from um, hospital-centric to patient-centric is commendable. Um, however, the world is not perfect. So if you are consolidating information for every patient in your systems, if your system is compromised by hackers, now let's say I have my information in your system, my entire medical records are compromised. So. Um, what sort of health standard regulations that you have to, you know, meet, and you know, what are what is the kind of rescue plan? Um, that's my question. Yeah, I mean, I, 
I think that, um, you know, the question of security and data security is only going to become more important as we kind of get deeper into uh, using data, get, using healthcare data outside of the four walls of a hospital. Um, I mean, my take on this is basically that um, we, we basically do all the state-of-the-art things that you can do, right? Um, we are very, at Picnic Health in particular, um, you know, not speaking for other companies, but we're very, very conscientious <coughs> about, um, about making sure and having a culture of, of not just doing security theater, right? Not just like checking the boxes that say like, okay, you know, we, we yes, we have this policy, um, but making sure that like all of the real ways that data ends up getting compromised, which is, you know, a lot, which ends up being like phishing attacks and like people putting their password on a sticky note on the side of their computer um, and really addressing like the fundamental ways um, that data actually becomes, you know, compromised in the real world. Um, so, you know, we take all of that like super, super seriously. Um, I think like, you know, having, having your data um, in a number of hospitals versus, you know, having your data in one place, like in my mind, it's bad if it gets publicly exposed in any situation. I don't know for me personally that sort of saying like, well, gee, that was only a third of my medical record. So like, that's totally cool that that got <laughs> compromised um, versus like having the whole thing um, makes that much of a difference. Like I think these, you know, sort of being smart about security um, and privacy and being very transparent with patients um, applies across the board, whether you're talking about data that's like, you know, being hosted, still being hosted in a basement um, in a hospital somewhere, or whether you're talking about data that you have, you know, on AWS with a with a BAA signed. Um, and no, I would add, um, if, uh, really um, uh, agree with that emphatically, um, in particularly your comments on the culture. I guess we're very sensitized to it um, at DNA Nexus because it's the sort of the core feature of the platform is this incredibly intense level of security. We've had all you know, the pharma audits and, and, and FDA and all of that on the basis of the security and it's exactly the, not just the box checking, but all of the, 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 the culture and the um, practicing against phishing and, and a whole range of different uh, preventive measures. I think the idea that, again, I, I, there's so much of this, I mean, I think you know, I, Robert Greene has done this so effectively for genetics, but I think more broadly, this sort of, every time you, know, you, you, you come here, it's like, well, this is different from the way we used to do it, and I'm very scared. And I'm not sure that's really the reason not to do things. The idea that, well, having all your healthcare assembled, you know, assembled information in a machine readable way versus, you know, in a bunch of notebooks, like what you can still have a, some concierge doc do now is somehow worse because it's more usable. Um, that, 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 that doesn't particularly, um, I understand the concern, but I would have much more faith in data from a, from a contemporary company that's focused explicitly on how to safeguard it than I might in some legacy system, like you're saying, running on a mainframe in the basement. Hi. <coughs> Mary Ann Boswell, Boston Lighthouse Innovations, and we're a startup, so we're not on the web yet. Um, a question for uh, Jamie and Noga. Do you have solid outcomes yet? Do you have any concrete uh, evidence that shows that um, lives have been directly impacted? And the, the other thing I wanted to know is, have you two talked because uh, my, re my recollection of patients like me is it's self-reported and wondering if that has been validated with actual medical records and maybe there's some synergies there. Jamie? You go first. Um, so uh, to answer the first question, um, just to be really transparent in our approach, we would love at some point to have validated studies. I think like from the very beginning, we were super clear as a company that um, that wasn't gonna be our bar at the beginning, right? Like our bar at the beginning is like, let's make patients' lives easier and let's get the data into the hands of the researchers, obviously with patient permission. Um, so, you know, I think like, I think we probably, I think probably everyone in this room believes that 
Um, I think probably everyone in this room believes that having patient EMR data structured and machine readable and in the right hands at the right time will produce better outcomes. There may be some folks that don't, but I think generally, you know, we all sort of believe that that's the right direction to move things. Um, and so from kind of a business model perspective and like a value proposition perspective, um, we knew that we couldn't, we knew that we couldn't um, launch with, you know, we knew we couldn't wait to launch the company until we would have those outcomes immediately. So we basically launched with, you know, a value proposition and outcomes that were like, the patient's life is easier and research is being enabled. Um, and I think that's, you know, I think you have to look for those incremental bars to, to get started. Um, but I, I feel confident that, you know, check back in, hopefully in a year um, and we'll have something more concrete to share. Okay, two more. Oh, did well, you want to do it real quick? Yeah, real quick. Please. So, so the, there's three answers. One is we should be working together. Um, and, and the reason we're not yet is um, because what we are focused on is finding information that is truly meaningful and predictive. And, um, and we are not making the assumption that the EMR is populated with a lot of that. So that's what st statement one. Statement two, so we want to work to find out what's in that. You know, there's just work to do there. Two, on validation, um, we have done multiple studies. Uh, so we have hundreds of anecdotes or thousands like Matt's of people that got information and changed their lives. Um, and not as sophisticated, but in simple ways, just finding the right physician or the right procedure. We've done multiple studies showing that attending to your health on platforms like ours or I'm sure on Picnic also produces dramatically improved outcomes. I mean, like way exceeding drugs. And three, we've run clinical trials verifying that with the VA and, and a couple of the contacts for sex study. Um, and uh, the, 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 the next part is just, I mean, I think it's just hard to imagine that attending to this information well and thoughtfully is not going to improve outcomes. Great. We have time for two more quick questions. And I hope at least one is for uh, Pamela, because Noor does so much great stuff. Someone should ask her about it. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Chong Ma, a research fellow in Children's Hospital. I'm sorry, my questions are also for Noga. <laughs> okay, and so I'm really interested and inspired by your idea to share the medical records. And uh, could you tell us more about the current model, how you gain the, the fully access of the medical records from medical providers or medical centers? What? Okay, you have both of the, so both, uh, let's both Noga and um, Pamela maybe should answer about how you, uh, what you're doing on the medical record um, aggregation side. Yeah. Do you want to talk about how we're work the project that we're working on? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, in that particular one, we're, 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 we're serving as a patient support funder, but a little bit different, but sure. I, I didn't get his, his entire question, so maybe you okay, should answer sure. it initially. Yeah, so, um, so our model is pretty straightforward. We have some, you know, access to electronic data sources, but in general, if you want to kind of think of like what's the baseline of how do we ensure, you know, for any one patient that we can get their data, we basically um, get patients to tell us where they've seen providers, just to brain dump whatever they can remember. They sign an authorization. Um, we, as automatically as possible, fax that authorization to a record request office. We, as automatically as possible, um, get uh, those records back. And then we basically use, you know, kind of what people call like human in the loop computing, combination of human curators and um, machine learning to go through and structure the data from those records. So it's, um, you know, a little bit of, magic and mostly a lot of um, grinding away. And then I guess so, uh, I guess not all the medicine practitioners would like to, are comfortable to share their medical records. So what are the concerns and uh, how, to, how do you persuade them to share their yeah, well, medical records? Well, fortunately, we do um, have this you know, thing in this country called HIPAA, which basically says that a patient has a right to get their medical records. So we actually don't have a lot of problems with physicians. I think, like, I think there's a lot of misinformation about that. I think in general, um, physicians do a ton of care coordination, right? Like anyone in this room, you know, you spend time reading through PDFs that um, patient, you know, that come for your, pa for your patients from other facilities. You have a staff that is, 
or maybe you're even doing it yourself. Like we get this, we hear this a lot from like fellows, like oh, I spent half my fellowship year faxing stuff and requesting faxes. Like the healthcare system already moves data around between providers. Um, putting the patient in the middle is just kind of a way to make sure it actually happens effectively. And with, with all of that detailed um, uh, data collection, you're gonna put ID fellows out of business. <laughs> all right, last, <laughs> last question. Hi, thank you, Carol Weil with the National Cancer Institute. Uh, and uh, apropos of the earlier comments about the incidentalome, um, there is, I think, a, a serious ethical debate in this country about the merits of returning raw data directly to patients. Some feel that this is um, uh, at a risk for patients. It makes them overreact. It overwhelms them. Others see that narrative as very paternalistic. And I wondered if you could comment, um, all of you, any of you, on, on um, that debate and where you stand. Yeah, well, I, I'm sort of out on one end of the spectrum. I say return everything all the time to everybody. Um, but it, with, with clear explanations of what it means. So if you're returning a genome uh, to, to, to a patient, you're going to be telling them that they have lots of mutations that make them different from everybody else. And what you're also going to tell them is that we can't tell you what most of them mean. Uh, so I think we, what we need is a better way of educating patients before we return the data to say, we're going to tell you a lot of stuff about you. And honestly, the answer to what most of your question is going to be, I don't know. Um, and you know, we, we may find variants in genes that are suggested that you might have predispositions for this kind of cancer or this kind of disease, but we, well, we don't have certainty there. And so we need, we need to get patients you know, comfortable with the idea of uncertainty. Um, and, and, and once we can do that, I think I'm, I'm fully in favor of returning as much as we possibly can. Um, but, but today, I think it's, it's critical that we, we sort of hit the, the high need patients right away. So if you're a rare disease patient uh, and the first shot at getting a diagnosis didn't, didn't happen, look over, look your genome first, you've got to have access to that genome to take it on for, for second, third, fourth interpretations. Um, uh, but ultimately, I'd like to see everybody have full access to their own genome and understand what it means when we say, I don't know, or I can't be certain what this means. And last word to Pamela. I just can't imagine living in a world where we believe that people don't have a right to information about themselves. It's just unimaginable. Do you have any dish, any? But it happens every day, um, <laughs> unfortunately, in the most change. simplest uh, of terms. Um, I would say, to echo what Matt says, the nice side of, of what he's, the, the compliment to what he said is that in the rare disease space, patients and caregivers and family members are, are have that stronger appetite. So it's a nice place to start. And, and I guess just two nuances on that is one, I think I dif differentiate between mandatory return and having the option to receive it. I mean, it's actually amazing how many genome scientists haven't had their genome sequence. I read Eric Lander hasn't. Um, I won't. Um, uh, I don't think that that's the point here. Basically, if you're if you're an anxious Jew, you don't. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> other and if you're like a cool Scotsman like you and Ashley, you do. Um, <laughs> he, as he told us on our uh, podcast. Um, but then I think that it's a slightly more complicated regarding the, um, the, the, the return of the data by, if you think it take it to the extreme. Let's say you have a genome sequence at 1x depth. I mean, you won't, but I'm, you know, it's like as, a, as an extreme example. Like, is that at, the, at some level, are you just returning random information? So I, I just don't know if there is there's a balance between, yes, patients have a right, don't have a right. Where it gets tricky, on the other hand, is people are doing things that are at a really good level, but are doing it under the, rubric of research so they don't have to return it, and it's almost, it, it's a little bit cynical that way, or it can be. So I, I certainly, uh, I think it was a fascinating discussion. I hope it continues over lunch. Thank, every, thank you, and <laughs> thank you.